Greetings, everyone. We are going to talk about continuous positive airway pressure, CPAP. And specifically, we're going to relate the use of CPAP to pulmonary edema. So there are certainly other indications. Uh, for example, the use of CPAP in asthma remains highly controversial. And so even though it's part of our protocol and it's certainly something you can do, um, the, the gross part of the literature and the data that exists on the use of CPAP in, uh, in respiratory events surrounds the use of CPAP for pulmonary edema. So let's take a look at this. Um, we'll take a look at this as briefly as we can. So uh, before we start, important to note that um, the use of CPAP uh, in pulmonary edema actually is extremely beneficial for the three main tenets, the three main components of of uh, treatment of pulmonary edema. So when we look at treatment of pulmonary edema, it centers on um, on a couple things here. So we're going to take a look at improving oxygenation. So that's that's one of the things that we want to do. We want to improve the oxygenation status of the patient. Um, we want to also uh, reduce pulmonary venous return. So that's just a fancy way for saying we want to decrease the preload. All right, we want to decrease the uh, amount of, uh, of fluid, essentially, that's coming back into, uh, into the, the vascular system, the, the venous system specifically. All right, and then lastly, we want to decrease systemic vascular resistance, and that's a fancy way of saying we want to decrease the after load. All right, so preload, man, I can't spell today. Uh, we want to uh, preload, decrease preload, pr uh, decrease afterload, and uh, in doing that, we're also going to improve the patient's oxygenation. So these are kind of the three main goals here that we want to do, uh, that we want to focus on when we're treating somebody with pulmonary edema. This is pulmonary edema, not embolism. All right, so this is pulmonary edema. All right, so use of CPAP, pulmonary edema. We're going to focus on these things. We're going to improve oxygenation, decrease the preload, and afterload. So let's take a look at how we're going to accomplish those things. And we're going to accomplish those things uh, with CPAP very nicely. So let's take a look at uh, the benefits. So as you know, um, uh, molecules, specifically oxygen, for example, um, it moves down its concentration gradient. So if you have 100 molecules of oxygen here, and they're separated by a membrane that allows oxygen to diffuse across that membrane, and here we have 40 oxygen molecules, the movement of oxygen will be from the high concentration towards the low concentration. In other words, it will travel down the oxygen, the oxygen gradient or the concentration gradient. So this is kind of an important concept because CPAP is going to do a couple things for us. CPAP is not only going to establish a concentration, when I put the brackets like this, this is chemical notation for concentration, it's not only going to increase the concentration of oxygen, and it's going to do that because we're going to use an FiO2 of 100%. So if you look at how we power our CPAP machines, it's exclusively with oxygen. We're not using air to do that. So we're using an FiO2 of 100%, which is going to cause an increase in the concentration of oxygen which is going to promote oxygenation. It's going to promote diffusion. It's going to increase the rate of diffusion. All right, in addition to the concentration, it's also going to increase the pressure of oxygen in the intrapulmonary space. So these are all good things because pressure and concentration, when you increase pressure and you increase the concentration of something, you are going to cause an increase in the rate and the quantity of diffusion. So rate and quantity of diffusion of oxygen are going to be, uh, are going to be improved and increased just by applying CPAP with 100% oxygen as the, the power driver, also by increasing the intrapulmonary pressure. So already we've accomplished one of the things that we want to accomplish. We want to um, we want to uh, increase and improve oxygenation, and we're going to do that by applying CPAP, running with 100% oxygen, and increasing the pressure, which is going to increase the overall rate and quantity 
of diffusion. All right, so this is the first great thing that's going to happen. All right, the next thing I want you to focus on is what exactly happens inside the lungs. So I'm going to draw a very crude picture of a person. This will be the chest. And inside the chest, we have these lungs that reside there. And this is obviously not a, uh, an accurate uh, representation of what things look like in the chest. But here are the lungs. And of course, we eventually lead out to the mouth here. And here we go. All right, so if you think about the way things work, we have a lot of, th we have a lot of mechanisms inside the body that are constantly regulating and monitoring pressures. And they're monitoring pressures everywhere. So some of the things we have inside the lungs, for example, we have stretch receptors. And that tells our body when we've uh, nearly overinflated our lungs. And that tells our body to either breathe less or to exhale or to do something different so that we can decrease the amount of stretch that exists on the walls or the tension on the walls of the lungs themselves and inside the bronchi and the bronchioles. All right, so we have some pressure receptors there. In fact, they're, they're stretch receptors that are there. We have these in the heart as well and blood vessels and other things, but specifically we're looking at the lungs right now. All right, the other thing that we have is we have a heart that sits right about here, and inside uh, the heart we have stretch receptors, but coming out of the heart, the aorta that comes out also has pressure receptors. So inside the aorta, and in the carotid bodies, we have pressure receptors. And these pressure receptors are designed to prevent over-pressurization of the vasculature. They are a mechanism that the body uses to bring in data about pressure inside the vasculature and relay that pressure to the brain, and then the brain decides to act on it somehow. So pressures that are inside the aorta are measured and sent off to the brain for interpretation and then for a response. So now I want you to think about normal pressures inside the chest. You take a breath in. The reason you take a breath in is because the diaphragm contracts. It causes a temporary negative pressure condition inside the lungs. And the negative pressure is relative to the atmospheric pressure outside of the lungs. So when the atmospheric pressure outside is greater than the pressure inside the lungs, so I'll say lung pressure, but it's really the intra-lung pressure, the intra-pulmonary pressure, then we have inhalation that takes place. All right, so this hopefully makes sense. If you, if you decrease the pressure in here, let's say you make it negative 4 millimeters, and out here we have... Uh, we have something greater than that. Let's just call it, I don't know, whatever you want, 40 millimeters of pressure difference. You're going to get airflow into the lungs. All right, so now what happens when we apply CPAP? Well, when we apply CPAP, we are doing continuous positive airway pressure. So positive pressure on the airway means that we have an increase in pressure. If we have an increase in pressure that is forced inside the lungs, we're actually going to do a couple things. We're going to change and we're going to target stretch receptors, so we're going to activate these guys. We're also going to activate the pressure receptors that are in the aorta and the carotid bodies, and those receptors are going to tell the brain, whoa, we have too much pressure. So if we have too much pressure at the level of the brain, the brain says, too much pressure in the vasculature, there are a couple things that we can do to change blood pressure. And you should remember these things because they're really important and they're things you're going to target later in your career. All right, so the first thing we can do is we can change delta, the triangle means change, the rate of the pump, the speed of the pump. In other words, heart rate. That's one thing we can do. If there's too much pressure, we're actually going to decrease the heart rate. All right, next thing that can happen is we can change the size of the container. So when we're talking about this, we're talking about the blood vessel diameter size. And in fact, here what we'll do is we'll increase the diameter. And if you increase the blood vessel diameter, you decrease the blood pressure. 
So too much pressure causes change in rate, change in the size of the diameter of the blood vessels, vasodilation, and last but not least, we're going to change the amount of fluid inside the container. So when we do this, you take the amount of fluid inside the container. If the pressure is too high, you decrease the volume, meaning that you pee this off or you shift fluid somewhere else. And all of these things, if you take all of these things together, they equal a decrease in blood pressure. Now, it's a little more complicated that because specifically what we're going to do is we're going to decrease two things. We're going to decrease the afterload or the peripheral uh, system, uh, the peripheral, I'm sorry, the, um, the vascular resistance, the systemic vascular resistance. So we're going to decrease systemic vascular resistance, which is going to cause a decrease in the afterload. All right, decreased systemic vascular resistance, decreased afterload. This is one of the effects that we have by causing a change in the size of the container. The other thing we're going to do is we're going to decrease the preload here. And this is the decrease in venous return. So decrease venous return equals a decrease in the preload. And these are the specific things that are happening when we decrease the blood pressure. All right, so, or that are causing a decrease in the blood pressure, essentially. So CPAP is kind of this great thing because one of the things we wanted to do is we wanted to reduce preload, we wanted to reduce afterload, and in fact, we're going to accomplish that by increasing intrapulmonary pressure. We're going to make it higher than it should be. We're going to activate the stretch receptors in the lungs. We're going to activate the pressure receptors in the aorta and the carotid bodies. And these things are going to tell the brain too much pressure. Brain is going to cause a couple things to happen. It's going to cause a decrease in heart rate. It's going to change the container size, meaning it's going to cause vasodilation. It's also going to cause a fluid shift at the level of the kidneys. It may do so by decreasing the volume by causing your kidneys to get rid of excess fluid if there's excess fluid in the body. All right, so that's going to cause a decrease in venous return. That's going to cause a decrease in the uh, systemic vascular resistance. In other words, we're changing preload and afterload, and those were really, really important things that we were targeting. So this is a really, really important concept. All right, so think CPAP, increased intrapulmonary pressure, decreases preload, decreases afterload. That's all caused by activation of stretch receptors inside the walls of the lungs themselves and the carotid and aortic bodies. Remember that these, uh, the application of CPAP is not a fix. It does not fix the problem. It is a temporizing measure only. It only temporarily buys us time so that we can actually fix the problem later with other drugs and other things. So um, I'm not mentioning uh, the addition of drugs at this, in this uh, particular case, but just remember that there are other things we can target here. So if we want to change the rate of the pump, um, we may administer something like a beta blocker. If we wanted to change uh, the size of the container, we can do that with nitroglycerin, for example. If we want to change the amount of fluid that the patient has, if they're fluid overloaded, we can diurese them with a, with a, uh, a diuretic and something like Bumex or Lasix. So we can actually target multiple things here by giving drugs in addition to the CPAP treatment. So a couple things of importance here if you haven't thought of them yet. Would it be reasonable to say that some patients will have a blood pressure of 200 over 130 and have pulmonary edema? And the answer is of course we can have pulmonary edema and the patient has hypertension, systemic hypertension. And in fact, if we apply CPAP, this is good stuff. Patient is happy because we affect all these things, preload, afterload, blah, blah, blah. Now, my question to you is, if a patient has a blood pressure of 90 over 50, let's say the patient has a blood pressure of 90 over 50 and they have pulmonary edema. Now, we don't know about CPAP. And the reason we don't know about CPAP is because if we apply CPAP, what happens to their preload afterload, meaning their blood pressure, it may decrease. 
So if we apply CPAP to this patient, we may end up with a blood pressure of 70 over 30. We've made our patient potentially worse. These are patients that are really, really sick. They may be in cardiogenic shock. They may require inotropes, things like dopamine and other pressor agents. And these are things that are very, very complicated that require a little bit more than a paramedic level understanding of physiology and pathophysiology. And, uh, and so we rely on the critical care guys and, uh, and the physicians to kind of provide some direction here. So what's the goal? Why am I telling you this? This patient is a no-brainer. 200 over 130 or normal blood pressure, normotensive pulmonary edema, you do the CPAP. Patient with borderline hypotension or obvious hypotension, consult. Important for you to obtain medical consult before applying CPAP. Not necessarily because it says to do so in the protocol, but more importantly because let's get a second set of eyes on the problem and say, hey, this is what I have. These are the blood pressure uh, conditions and I'm concerned about the CPAP, but this patient has pulmonary edema and they have a history of MI or they're having an MI and they might be in cardiogenic shock. What would you like me to do? Let's see if we can get somebody else to provide you some feedback on what the best course of action is for these patients. So this is CPAP in a nutshell as it relates to application in pulmonary edema. Here are some of the considerations. So the, this, is, this is how CPAP affects the change. Here are some of the considerations, the physiological changes that you'll see with the application of CPAP. These are benefits to us because remember, at the very beginning of all this, we wanted to accomplish a couple things in our treatment of CPAP. One of the things we wanted to do is improve oxygenation. We're doing that with CPAP. One of the things we wanted to do is to decrease preload. We got that. And then last but not least, decreased uh, to decrease the afterload. All of these things are accomplished with the application of CPAP. All right, if you have any other questions about this, there's a ton of stuff online about this. I'll post some, uh, some resources online as well, some literature resources, but feel free to do the research yourself. You can go to scholar.google.com or you can use um, NIH's uh, PubMed Central if you want. That also is, uh, is going to work for you there. And uh, if you have any questions, bring them to class. We'll certainly go over any of this that we need to. Thanks.